The Small Business Show, episode 213, for Wednesday, March 6th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to The Small Business Show, the show BFA Small Business, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And out on the West Coast, I am Shannon Jean. How are you, Dave? I'm good, man. How are you? Good. good. I'm uh, fantastic. Keeping busy of, as usual. That's a that's a good thing, man. I've yeah. I've I always say that being busy busy is better than the alternative, and I have had occasions in my life to prove that to myself, and it is actually quite true. So there you go. Yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. So, Hey, uh, today, you know, as you know, if you've listened to the show before, you know, that I'm, my background is in, you know, products and shipping them all over the place, shipping them into me, shipping them all around. So lots of logistics. And, uh, we have a guest today that's come back on the show. Uh, one of my favorite logistics experts, uh, Kellen Raff is with us and we're going to talk about, you know, how critical uh, logistics are for your, your entire business and incoming and outgoing shipping, selling through FBA with Amazon and fulfillment services and uh, lots of stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to have Kellen Raff back with us, a logistics expert and president of Optimum Supply Chain. Kellen, thank you for joining us again. Thanks so much, Shannon. Great to talk yeah. to you again and, and uh, Dave as well. How's it going? Yeah, it goes. Yeah, thanks for coming Good, back. Man. It's almost yeah. been three years. It was show 62. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. yeah. That's crazy. Well, that's, yeah. Well, it's yeah, great right. that we're all still here talking. <laughs> yeah, See? I've listened to a bunch, a bunch of your shows since then, and uh, me being in a small business myself have, uh, have gotten a lot of good advice there. Well, thank you for saying that, man. That's yeah, that's why we that's do awesome. what we do. And now you're and you're a part of it. I was going to say now you're a part of it, but you've been a part of it. So it's yeah, no, it's awesome. It's a good family we've got. Yeah. Yeah. It works out great. We love doing it. So before we get into talking about some of the other topics and shipping and logistics, talk about your background a bit for our listeners and, you know, and sh share what services that you offer at Optimum Supply Chain, if you will. Sure. Yeah. So I got back, I got into, involved in uh, international supply chain uh, back in college. I started working for DHL Express. Um, and uh, once I graduated from college, moved to Asia, uh, was doing a lot of manufacturing and sourcing there in Asia, supplying big box stores here in the US, um, and was back and forth between California and Hong Kong far too much. So I ended up moving out there another time as well. Um, just really fell in love with international business and then started um, a, a eBay store back in 2001. Um, it was pretty interesting early times, uh, direct to consumer. You know, I was supporting some uh, direct to consumer businesses uh, through DHL Express in the early days as well. Um, and just really got a, you know, good bite of the bug of international and direct to consumer. That's actually how um, Shannon and I met is I was his sales rep for DHL yeah, Express. Right. And he was building his businesses and, and uh, Mac, what was it? Mac Restore. Uh, yeah, it was, re it was eventually became uh, I rescue, but yeah, DHL was how we kind of got our foot in the door with all that, uh, you know, local shipping. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I was with DHL until uh, to kind of like slow down of 2007, 2008, I had finished my MBA and I thought, you know, I'm going to go out and um, and create a consulting business that's going to help um, all of you know the, all of these marketplace uh, shippers and sellers that um, really needed the expertise uh, but weren't finding it from the logistics providers. So I started Optimum uh, in 2008, and uh, it's been a wild ride of supporting you know many cool products and brands since then. And so um, the, our our uh, primary service is in fulfillment and shipping services. Um, we're managing a lot of uh, imports from Asia uh, by ocean and air freight, as well as uh, fulfillment, you know, receiving and warehousing and fulfillment of orders, um, B2B, as well as uh, direct to consumer. A lot of Amazon stuff these days, a lot of Walmart stuff, a lot of um, direct to uh, QVC and home shopping and, and uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, many other retailers too. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a great story. I mean, I, I remember and we've worked with each other on a bunch of different projects and and, uh, you know, your ad value has always been, hey, I can save you money uh, because I know that there's, uh, you know, inefficiencies in the supply chain that that we can uh, you know all save on so that that's, I've always appreciated that. 
That's cool. Well, and that's, so, a, you know, for anybody looking to create a business like that, that's a great thing to look for is what are the inefficiencies that drive you crazy and then go help somebody else solve those and they'll pay you for it. Like it's, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. What, what problem are you solving? Yeah. What uh, problem are you solving? Yeah. Yeah. So the impetus for asking, you know, you back calendars, I was on LinkedIn a few, uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess. And I, I noticed your comments about, uh, some upcoming changes to the Amazon FBA, the fulfilled by Amazon program uh, and how some of those changes were frustrating. And I'm quoting frustrating marketplace sellers with eroding margins and unpredictable costs. And I thought, man, I've been exactly there, especially in the technology business where our margins just kept getting thinner and thinner. And then these, the unpredictability of your, of your billing and what you're getting charged for on these marketplaces can just be a killer. Uh, so I'd love to hear some feedback on that and uh, see where we can go with that topic. Yeah, sure. Um, Amazon has been, you know, fantastic for so many sellers. Um, you know, just look at how many new sellers are on there each year. I think it's like 300,000 new sellers a year. Wow. Like that. Um, just absolutely amazing. And it's been a huge success for uh, many companies, uh, including my customers as well. Uh, but it's also been very, very tough with all the changing rules. So officially, Amazon will say that they're going to, um, you know, change the rules like once a year. Um, but when they do, there's not much notification of that. Um, it's very secretive. And then when they do launch these new rules, there's not a lot of support um, for how to read the rules you know, how to adjust to these things and you know, selling and fulfilling on Amazon has been, you know, complicated as, as is at any retailer, um, you know, working with any retailer, whether you're selling wholesale to them or you're selling, you know, on a um, drop ship through target.com, things like that. There's always a lot of complexity and, you know, some landmines that you certainly need to um, stay away from. But uh, what's happened with Amazon, I think, especially is that, because it's such a big part of so many companies' business these days that small rule changes can really have a, a major impact on a company's not only like quarter or a certain item, but um, really the, the whole year. Um, and I've wow. seen you know a lot of really, really challenging situations from uh, um, from counterfeit items to return rates and uh, just just challenges that the sellers and the, the product, you know, brands were never expecting when they penciled it out of what their margins would be and things like that. Yeah, that makes sense. I can attest to, you know, uh, trying to stay current, um, on the, with Amazon and, and, uh, uh, keeping up with the rule changes and, and keeping compliant is, can be very difficult. And then when you're, uh, uh, you have a problem and you're trying to resolve it, you often can be uh, stymied by uh, sort of like templated responses and kind of auto response. It's, it can be really challenging to uh, get to a human that can, that can really help you uh, figure out the problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there aren't a lot of solutions many times when they present you with something that's going to drastically change your margin. Um, and you look at it and you're like, well, there's, what else can we do? You know, yeah. there might be other ways that you could get around that. But the fact of the matter is it's going to uh, hurt your business. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So uh, on that same topic, I mean, are, do you see and, you know, you're in the in the market all the time and talking to these companies and trying to help them. Are there companies that they go into, you know, the FBA program or uh, a similar program and, and are just like, OK, great. This is going to solve all our problems and, and it's going to be so awesome. We're going to have all these extra sales. And then they kind of come if they don't plan correctly, they can they can live to regret it. Yeah, um, many, you know, FBA is a fantastic solution to get into because you can just um, list the items, you know, ship it in there. Everything's taken care of for a small business, especially somebody who's starting out on Amazon or starting out in a direct to consumer space, it's fantastic to have these integrated services. Yeah. Um, there's really been nothing like, uh, Amazon FBA. And that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful. And one of the reasons Amazon has been so successful with, um, their customer services, being able to control that fulfillment, you know, it's, it's still even common practice. I see online sometimes, Oh, allow three to five days for us to ship your item. And then you don't even know, you know, it's obviously not on Amazon. It's yeah. on other sites. You don't even know when you're going to get it. And so 
Amazon's really the one who introduced that, like, we're going to ship this the same day and you're going to get it within two days. And now it's even faster than that with the same day and, and next yeah. day. Um, yeah, it's pretty pretty right, right, in the, right in the shopping cart for free. So how how far does because it sounds like I mean, on the, on paper this and I'm asking this as someone that's never used FBA. But, you know, if I were getting into business, certainly on paper, it sounds like, well, I, like this is fantastic. And then I'm hearing, well, it's not as fantastic as it is on paper. But at the moment, it's still probably the best game in town. Uh how long does it take until someone else steps in and actually starts competing with with Amazon in that realm? Or is that not even like on the on the table at this point because of how ubiquitous Amazon has become? I mean, is it just one of these things where as a small business, you kind of have to take it and there's no other place to go? Or what's the what's the answer there? Yeah. There definitely are options. You know, FBA is super quick to just turn on and, and have it running. And then you can kind of optimize later, sure. you know, regarding different pricing and costs and what kind of inventory availability that you're going to provide and all of that. Um, yeah, there are other services that are popping up uh, because of the need. So FBA can't fulfill all of the demand, especially, you know, they don't want to handle non-conveyable items, larger items. Um, they're, it, you know, there are many, many product uh, characteristics that would say, don't have it shipped by FBA, do seller fulfilled prime instead. Um, and then because of just the, the, you know, the volume of demand, um, there are third party logistics companies now that do offer these seller fulfilled prime services. So you can locate your inventory at these other, you know, non Amazon FBA locations and be able to um, fulfill according to oh. um, the requirements of Amazon. And so then it's kind of like the hybrid where you're not fulfilling yourself. And I don't recommend that the companies fulfill themselves. Um, it, they would have to be of quite a larger size and you definitely want to have multiple inventory locations around yeah. the U S in order to do that. Otherwise it's just going to be all air, but it depends. It depends on the margins that you have. It depends on your competition. Um, what's the product size and things like that. Sure. Um, but definitely there are new services uh, coming out where you can um, have your, um, you know, your own FBA type of, of uh, solution. And that's um, whether you're selling on, you can still sell via Amazon or any of the other marketplaces and then use the third party logistics uh, partner to fulfill the orders. Yes, exactly. Okay. And that's what um, the benefit of doing that in a third party party is that you can uh, leverage the same inventory item across multiple channels. Yeah, right. That seems, so that seems like a channel. huge, yeah, that, that, that seems like such a smart thing to do um, and not putting all your uh, eggs in one basket, so to speak. Well, uh, and with also them. without having to put all your eggs in your own basket. I mean, unless you, yeah. unless you are in the fulfillment business, you probably don't want to be in the fulfillment business, right? That's a distraction from, you know, making, making and, and creating and selling your actual product. So yeah, that's, that sounds really smart. I like it. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. Our, one of our most common recommendations is do not try to do fulfillment yourself unless there's some very long strategic purpose that you need to do sure. this, or if you're doing something locally and that's great. Um, but there are, um, you know, the scalability and, um, you know, the, uh, making costs variable rather than fixed and getting out of the labor issues and all that stuff. It's so much better to have a third party doing it for you. Yeah. That makes sense. It does sense. make sense. Yep. Hey guys, yep. this is fantastic. And I, I want to, I want to get back to this, but first I want to take a break and talk about our first uh, two sponsors. If that's okay with you, Shannon. Yeah. Sounds great, man. All right. Our first sponsor today is Molecule at M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot -E com. It is the only air purifier that actually destroys pollutants. And we love Molecule because, well, because I've been using it for months and it works really, really well. And it's changed our lives completely. My wife's allergies uh, are completely gone when she's sleeping and it like makes a huge difference. But we also love Molecule because of the way they run their business, right? It's a complete reinvention of the air purifier, not just an improvement on existing outdated technology. In fact, Molecule replaces 50 year old antiquated technology because 
molecule introduces a breakthrough science that is finally capable of destroying air pollutants at a molecular level. Hence their name, right? They use this PICO technology that goes beyond the normal HEPA filtration, not just to capture, but completely destroy the full spectrum of indoor air pollutants, including those a thousand times smaller than what a HEPA filter can trap. And I can tell you firsthand that it makes a difference. One customer even said that she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. That customer might have been my wife. It's really quite something. You've got to check this thing out. They've done a remarkable job on not only the elegance of the design, but of course, the way it functions. Molecules technology has really been personally effective for us and verified by science. But most importantly, it's been tested by real people. And we've got a deal for you. For 75 bucks off your first order, visit Molecule, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com. And at checkout, enter promo code SBS. Again, that's Molecule, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com. And at checkout, enter promo code SBS. S, our thanks to Molecule for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor is Keeps. Listen, losing your hair sucks. And two out of three guys will experience hair loss by the time they're 35. Shannon and I both happen to be blessed with full heads of hair. And we understand the benefits that come with having a full head of hair. It looks good when you're meeting with people. It looks good all the time, Right. This is something that we understand, and we also sympathize with folks that maybe aren't quite as fortunate as we are. That's why we're really happy to have partnered with Keeps here, because we can help you. Keeps is the easiest and most affordable way to keep the hair that you have. And here's an even better part. For just five minutes now and starting at just 10 bucks a month, You'll never have to worry about hair loss again. It's super easy. Like I said, in five minutes, you just answer a few questions, snap some photos of your hair. A licensed physician will review all your information online and recommend the right treatment for you. Then it's shipped right to your door every three months. Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products out there. Some of you have probably tried them before, but you've probably never gotten them for this price. Keeps is only 10 to 35 bucks a month. Plus, now you can get your first month for free. That's one heck of a deal for getting to keep your hair. So check this out. To receive your first month of treatment for free, go to keeps.com slash SBS for small business show. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash SBS. That's a free month of treatment at keeps.com slash SBS. And the convenience of being on your schedule and not having to schedule with a doctor's schedule. And if you have a question, it's 24 hours and you actually get an answer. Imagine that an answer from a medical professional. This is amazing. And you can do it all from your own home. It's discreet. Keeps.com slash SBS. Our thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this episode. All right, Shannon, back to you. Cool. OK, so I want to talk about the uh more, a little more logistics, but I, I want to talk about your business as well. So that kind of analysis where you're looking at uh, someone's supply chain in and out and that kind of thing, that that's the kind of services that you're offering and that you would sit down with a company and, exp and kind of show them how perhaps a third party logistics, uh, you know, program would make sense for them. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So what we focus on is on optimization of logistics um, we take a look at what's the, um, you know, the existing business, where the volumes are flowing, um, what carriers are being used, what modes are being used. We do a digital, you know, data assessment of, um, of that logistics supply chain. Um, and then we have many, many models of uh, different solutions for doing cross-border between countries, for doing warehousing and a third-party fulfillment for uh, using USPS um, to ship to a residence versus uh, some of the other carriers um, ground delivery with a residential surcharge, things like that. And um, we always find um, many cost reduction opportunities. 
So being able to get um, that same service at a lower cost or, um, or at a faster speed. So rather than shipping something two day air, what if we could ship it um, ground and it still arrived there within two days is one example. And then what if we could um, locate our inventory closer to our customer where instead of sending two day air, we're now sending next day ground. And that's where a big impact comes from. Um, And then international as well. We're doing um, a lot of international um, fulfillment. So you know, maybe make manufacturing a product in China, um, fulfilling traditionally through the U S then you've got a customer in Australia rather than shipping from, um, your LA inventory. Why not have an inventory available from China or Hong Kong that can fulfill that Australia trade lane. And then that same thing goes out to the whole, to the rest of the world, to every region, uh, where there are, where there are, uh, consumers of the product. Yeah, that's great. That's a big deal. I mean, a lot of times, you know, the difference between making money on a product or losing money on it, or, uh, is that, you know, being smart with your logistics. Um, and I, I, unfortunately I can attest to that, (laughs) you know, thinking, (laughs) thinking that I mean, I'm kind of a control freak and like to keep, you know, uh, control of all the inventory and what happens with it and this, that, and the other, but, uh, it's very expensive to, uh, fulfill all those orders by yourself very expensive and probably, and, and it's just not as efficient and you're not as good at it as, uh, these folks that, you know, their whole reason for, uh, being in business is, is just that figuring out the most efficient ways to, uh, to get products to your customers. Mm-hmm. And that's why FBA has done so well. And Amazon, you know, for it also is that they've taken the complexity out of that and then it gets shipped on their account and, you know, there's some split of the cost there, but um, it really takes a very complex process of order management of fulfillment and returns and all of that stuff and makes it just kind of opt in. Yeah, that's cool. OK, so when we had you on the show back in April of 2016, you came on and you were talking about uh, Grand Canal Solutions. That was episode 62. Uh, th- g- give us a little uh, global view of the difference, you know, with Grand Canal and Optimum and how they kind of intersect each other. Yeah, sure. Um, so Grand Canals is a shipping software uh, that enables shipping managers to optimize their shipping with FedEx, UPS, USPS, DHL, uh, mostly the small parcel services. Okay. Um, and we at Optimum actually created that, that software internally. We were using it. First rendition was in Excel, and then we started breaking Excel and then moved over to SQL, and then that kind of wasn't fast enough. And so we substantiated it into a software and then spun it out as Grand Canals. Got it. And so that's like a software as a service that a company would subscribe to to be able to do- uh, manage uh, that inf- that data. Yeah, exactly. So it's for uh, to manage carrier performance. You know what's being delivered on time, what's early, what's late, things like that. Which carriers are performing the best? Um, also to do um, rate management. You know, making sure that you're getting billed correctly, making sure that um, you're getting the best rates possible for each of the different ship types that you have. Nice. Um, and then into fulfillment visibility as well to, to be able to see orders, um, you know, in real time and things. That's great. It's really cool. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like it. And I remember one of the things you taught that I learned from you and I've totally stolen because I always tell other people and they think I'm much smarter than I really am, is that uh, the fees are often what kill you the most on the on the. Uh, uh, freight, you know, the shipping to, especially in small, small parcel stuff where, you know, we would negotiate a great rate with the carrier, but then you get hit with these, uh, you know, residential fee out of the area fee, uh, unable mm. to deliver fee, all this kind of stuff. And I can remember Kellen, you, you know, being like, Oh yeah, we got to go back and knock these fees out because they're eating you alive. So I, I, I never forget that. Yeah. And the common, I, I remember with you as well, working with your carriers that, you know, the, I heard the same thing that I hear with most sales reps and they say, Oh, those aren't negotiable. (laughs) (laughs) Everything's negotiable. Yeah. Of course they are. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's when sort of the mistruths start happening, unfortunately. So um, the software that we have and the practice that we have um, really translate what the reality is. And um, we help our customers to get the best rates and best service um, from all of their shipping partners. So do the UPS and FedEx guys and DHL, do they like when you walk in and they see you, you and, or one of your reps in there, just kind of 
get sad looking because they know you're just going to beat them up and get get yeah. better rates for the customer. <laughs> yeah, you know we don't we don't um, go. We're not in that room. Oh, um, that's good anymore. We're basically supporting our customers to do their own analysis and negotiation themselves. Ah, okay, um, and that's it. Works much better. The relationships that each business has really need to be managed themselves. Um, you know, we don't get in and broker those things. We, we have some, you know, shipping services that our customers can avail of us, but, um, yeah, for the negotiations, it's directly. That makes sense. But you give them the data so they can back up their, Hey, look, you know, this is what's happening and how do we fix it type thing? Yeah, exactly. And then we catch the mistakes that are made in pricing as well, which it happens at least half the time, you know, the carrier will give you a new pricing proposal and they'll give you. Uh, like a PowerPoint presentation that shows, you know, the savings and things like that. And their math is frankly wrong. Yeah. Um, that's a big part. And then once the, once the pricing is actually put into effect, we'll do audit, you know, going forward and we'll find many, many times that that first week or first few weeks of a new pricing being put in place that the carrier actually programmed it incorrectly. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's we catch deal. it all the time, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, so and, I I, I have a question here. No, this is very interesting. You you're running a business, obviously, where you're helping people and hopefully uh, creating more value for them than than your services cost, right? I mean that that's just like standard yeah. practice, right? Uh, but what's interesting is when you said no, you're you're there, like you don't get in the middle of those negotiations, and I agree with you. It's much better. If, you know, your customer can have a direct relationship with the shipper because then like they build that and there's some trust there and and they're not one step removed by having you in the middle. So you're and it's just but it's an interesting model uh, and I think a smart one. But, you know, anybody looking at that at any type of business where, you know, you could put yourself you could hang your shingle as a broker. You've actually taken that and and changed it that you're hanging your shingle as a, a sense, essentially a consultant. Is that am I am I sort of grokking that right? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So we're doing advisory. We're yeah. um, you know, providing intelligence and we're providing feedback and a partnership um, to our customer. And then they use that information and those tools that we afford them um, to make better business. That's great. Yeah, that's great. That it's just great. a really smart way of going about business because you're. Instead of uh, limiting your customers, you're actually empowering your customers and chances are their businesses will grow b better because of that. And and then hopefully, you know, you thrive as a result of that, too. So it's, it's just it's a very uh, it's not it's clear that this is not your first business, right? Like you, you thought about this. It takes it takes some some iteration to get to this point. I think that's really just a smart lesson to learn. Yeah, it's been fun supporting all these supply chains of cool products, um, you know, just over many, many years uh, being involved in the, the planning and um, and the execution of taking companies and really making, you know, putting them on the map and making them successful. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah exactly. Great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and for me, I mean, what I recall, one of the most frustrating parts of it that you've kind of solved with your software and, and your service is uh, the disconnect between what you're told and what you negotiate and then what happens when the invoices start showing up in your accounting office and the accounting department doesn't have any idea what you should be paying. And I can remember looking at bills going, well, this can't be right. You know, we're quoting these things out. We were doing lots of flat rate shipping back at that time where we just said, hey, it's a flat X to get your laptop overnight. And we had built all that model around certain uh expectations and, and, uh, you know, way the numbers looked, but often it wouldn't work out that way. So now, you know, having that, uh, exposure on, on the real data is I think critically important. It's great. So uh, let me ask you a question. I, I want to ask, uh, when I ask everybody this, wh what's one of the biggest challenges you have, uh, for your business for optimum and, and how do you guys overcome it? I mean, is it a sales thing? Is it getting your foot in the door? Is it uh, making the connection and convincing them it's still going to work? I mean, what, what's, what is that challenge that you face? Mm, I would say it's awareness, um, that, you know, once people find us, um, and our practice, um, and are able to wrap their heads around it a little bit, um, it's, it's easy after that. We provide a ton of value very quickly at a very low cost to, 
you know, to many businesses because we are so specialized and it's very easy for us to just say, oh yeah, here, you can subscribe to this and there you go, you're running. Um, the, the selling part of it, like if I were to go door to door and be pitching these services is, is super hard because there is a distrust. It's like, yeah. what, this is different. I don't really get it. You know, oh, my carrier said that I have the best rates in town on, or on the block or whatever. And so why would you be able to get something better um, for us? Um, and it really comes down to just the tools that we have. We're just faster. It's not that we have more information than anybody else out there. It's just that we do this every day and we've collected all this information and we know the truth from um, from mistruth. And we know which services are going to perform and we know which ones are going to be challenged. And so we continue to um, optimize our customers' um, supply chains with those new solutions. So as soon as anything new comes out that's proven, um, then we'll be the first ones to bring it to our customer base and say, hey, we just launched this new type of service. Here's how it works. If you know, It will match your business if you're like this and that. Oh, that's great. So, okay. So how do you... Uh how do you get that to that awareness? How do you make them aware of, of what you're doing? Cause I think that's a common problem. A lot of people have where with their, their businesses and say, well, it's yeah. such a great thing, but uh, you know, how do I get them to pay attention? What do you guys do to make yourself stand out? You know, that's a good question. And, um, at grand canals, what we did was we raised a series, a fund. We raised about a little over $5 million and a vast, a lot of it, not a majority, but a lot of it went to marketing. Yeah. And that's really, really hard to do. That's kind of the traditional way of go to market is that you would say, you know, Hey, we need to take this market. We need to get that awareness. Let's go pay for it. And I think that that's, what's been the challenge of a lot of Amazon sellers and other online retailers is that yes, they're selling and yes, they're growing, you know, top line revenue, but it's coming at the cost of margins and that they're, I would say most of the, top 100 online retailers in America, I'll bet the majority of them are not even making a dollar. I mean, they're losing yeah. money. Yeah. And so it becomes a chase and a race and it is a race to satisfy the customer. The customer will never be satisfied. And so, you know, this new um, retail apocalypse and, and all is very, very real. I think that many of the retailers in America have been just subsidizing their business to keep the lights on and to keep, you know, employees, um, employees there and there's a legacy. Um, but the well is running dry on how much you can really subsidize loss. Yeah, um, I would agree. And and I, I always, you know, you, you alluded to it, I think in what you were just talking about, there's always somebody th- that's willing to, uh, we joked around about it, willing to go out of business, you know, and sell it for less than, and you look at it, go, how, how can that work? It doesn't even make any sense. I know this market really well, and I know they're not making any money. And then you see it, they go out of business, but then sure enough, there's somebody else that thinks they're going to come in and buy market share and they're going to sell it at a loss for a while. And there always seems to be enough of those people to subsidize it to the consumer, but maybe, maybe not as much, you know, maybe we're hitting a wall with, like you said, some of those retailers. Yeah, there definitely is the the real physical wall, because if you're not willing to support the business with investment, then um, the end is near. You know, if you if you do have some slowdown in the economy um, and it doesn't pencil out that this business is going to survive, then the fast the best thing to do is close it now. Right. Yeah. Um, And I think that's another issue is that there are so many businesses these days that are subsidized with uh, venture capital that they don't have to make money. And so for the sake of disruption, they're coming in to to win customer, to get experience, to, you know, to, um, to grow the market share. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's really hard to compete with. It and is. that's what's happening now on Amazon too. I mean, yeah. so many customers who may be, um, looking at Amazon or I'm sorry, sellers looking at Amazon, looking at FBA, all the complexity here. Um, Amazon could be their number one competitor in five years. Uh, yeah. We don't really know. We've seen it happen enough. Sure. Yeah. Amazon yeah. could be their number one competitor right now. I mean, like depending on what they're selling and what they're doing. Yeah. 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 Between the private labeling and, yeah. uh, you know, wanting to get in that went, I mean, they're, they're looking at all the data and thinking, Oh, that's a great market. We need to get into that. Yep. <laughs> so it's, it's always a challenge. Um, okay. So uh, I probably asked you this uh, back on uh, you know previous episode three years ago, but I'm going to ask you again, we, we all learn from our mistakes 
uh, so much. Uh, I've made a ton of them. So it's always a tradition for me to ask, you know, what, what's one of the best mistakes that you've made with your, you know, business career uh, that has taught you the most that you can share with us today? <laughs> that's, that's good. I, I remember that question from the last time. I remember my answer as well. And it's, I think I can even follow that up. So I think what I answered that time was I took my eyes off of the customer. We got very, very busy internally. Um, and we were focused on making, you know, software and just really more of the tech of it and kind of lost visibility of the customers. Um, and so what's been great is I, I left that business about a year and a half ago. I left my full-time role there and, um, basically said, I'm going to go back directly to customers and I'm going to work as I was, um, with optimum before where it was, you know, one customer, one supply chain at a time. And so that's been really fun to go back to, you know, really focusing on the customer. And I, I've studied a lot of what Bezos, um, you know, uh, preaches as well about, you know, customer being number one and just, it's all about this customer. It's, um, fantastic, uh, professional career as well Yeah, to be, you know, focused and caring about that customer and about their success. And then, you know, my business is therefore successful because of that. It, I, I've it's always, well, I've always said every business is the customer service business, but I, I've also, um, I don't know how often I've said it, but I've, I've all often thought how easy it is to want to do the work when your focus is on the customer, like the, the work it, the, you got to do the hard work no matter what, but when you know you're helping someone, man, like it just makes life so much easier and you're not, there's no friction. You're just like, okay, what, what can I do to help you? Great. We will do that. You know, and off you go. Yeah. It's a, it's that, I think it's, it's the, the simplest path to success and so many businesses overlook it, including me at times. Right. I mean, even though I know this and you, you know, you said the same thing happened to you, you get distracted by all the other stuff that comes up and it's like, no, no, no customer first, customer first. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It makes it much easier to make decisions along the way as exactly. well. I mean, you get into some preparation and you're like, oh, what should I do here? And you're like, well, what would my customer want me to do? It's really easy to say that. It's really, yeah, yeah the answers present themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It leaves a lot. Leaves, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention too before we wrap things up is that, uh, you know, you made a comment about expectations and satisfying the customer. And a lot of what we see, especially selling in different marketplaces, it's not that Amazon is necessarily, you know, being heavy handed to create all these rules uh, or eBay or Target, whoever, Walmart, wherever you're selling. It is that is the market that we are in. And they're like, OK, well, if you want to be in this market, this is what's required of you. Uh, I, I would argue that that's it makes your company better. Uh, more efficient. I think the the bad part of that is these big marketplaces, they're not the best communicators and they don't uh, kind of stage it in time for you to, you know, make changes that may be required for, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, um, that's been a big part of what's happening. You know, the, the risk of planning, right? If you're yeah. doing some strategy on a new product and new pricing and new labeling and new, all this stuff, and then all of a sudden the rules change, it's like, you know, it's kind of like what the, what's happening with the U.S.-China trade war right now. It's like, how can you possibly manage like these very large, complex, long supply chains when you don't know if there's going to be a 25% duty yeah. or 100% duty? I mean, that's ridiculously different. Yeah, it's insane. It, yeah. it really is. Mixed mostly different. now is that um, companies on Amazon and, you know, like your customer base that's selling direct to consumer on all platforms is they're sort of doing it all. So it's like... Uh, some items are FBA, some are fulfilled by themselves, um, some, you know, and then really just set out that multi-channel, multi-strategy um, rather than relying on one. Because if you only rely on one and you don't control that channel, um, you could be turned off immediately. And I just saw yesterday on LinkedIn, there was a bunch of hubbub about um, 1P versus 3P. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term. It's the... Um, you know, you sell wholesale to Amazon and then they set, they are the seller and they fulfill your item, you know, on their order oh. or you do third party and a bunch of, uh, wholesale sellers didn't receive their orders. Like they typically would on a Monday. It's Ooh. like a, a clockwork. They're yeah, purchase orders, orders, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're purchase orders. And right. so on yesterday there was a, a bunch like 
thousands of comments about this as well, that people are like, Oh my God, is it, is it this the time? Is this when it's going to happen? You know? Yeah. And so I can't imagine trying to run a business where you've got inventory and you've got your paying factories and you're like moving this product, trying to, to make some small percentage, but then all of a sudden have a risk of, you know, major, major interruption. Yeah. It's tough. That's cool. Crazy. Well, it sounds like, uh, you know, people need a good partner like, uh, you know, your company at Optimum Supply Chain and some great software to help them make those decisions. So tell us uh, what's the best way for our listeners to learn more about Optimum and how to connect with you. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I think that's okay. the easiest way. You know, email is just way too much spam in all these days. Uh, so search me up on LinkedIn. It's K E L A N. The last name is Raph, R-A-P, as in Peter H. And Perfect. we'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile in our show notes, too. So people can always go to businessshow.co to find uh, to find out how to get in touch with you and also us. So it works out great. Yeah, that's perfect. And what's a, what's the a website for Optimum Supply Chain? It's optimum-sco for supply chain optimization. So optimum-sco.com. Awesome, man. Well, it's great. I always learn a lot when I talk to you. And like I said, and I can steal lots of tidbits and makes me sound smarter than I actually am. So I always appreciate that. Well, thanks. Uh, it's been great having great customers like you as well. So. That's cool. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, folks, if you have questions, feedback at businessshow.co or come over to the Small Business Support Group on Facebook at businessshow.co slash Facebook. We would be glad to talk with you. Indeed. And keep living that charmed life, folks. And folks, and we'll see you next week. Kellen, thanks for coming back on the show. It's been great to have you, man. Thanks, Dave.